This is Joe Todd with the Oklahoma Historical Society. The following is a speech by Mr. Gene Cranfield at the April 1973 meeting of the El Reno Historical Society on the run of 1889. And tonight, I had a program on the, this is April, the opening month of the home. Well, if I tell you how many years he's been teaching, you might not consider him too young. He's a Calumet boy, El Reno. He attended school in Calumet and El Reno both. And uh, he was hired when he graduated to teach sixth grade at UConn. And after three years why he was made principal down there. And he was, we were sure approved of it because he's a very strict disciplinarian. And he had the nice, easy way of doing it where the kids liked it. It wasn't, it wasn't murder to have to go up to principal's office because he counseled with them and had good relations. And they say if you want anything done, get somebody's business. So I'll read what the Yukon paper had this last week, and you, I'm sure there's a lot of people here that's been school teachers. And you can decide whether he's busy. The board voted approval for a written list of responsibilities for the administrative assistant to the superintendent. Gene Cranfield is serving in that capacity. His duties as outlined in the report include supervision of all phases of elementary education, with elementary principals responsible to both he and the superintendent, employment of elementary teachers, responsible for transportation, including bus routes, bus maintenance, and bus drivers and minister the lunchroom program, including finances, records, and purchasing, administration of the maintenance of the school building. So you can judge for yourself whether he's a busy boy or not. We can now get it. You can kind of it. I uh, had a little chore to do in 
in an English class. And that was to write a term paper. Well, it's the first experience I ever had with a term paper. Well, I wondered, wondered what should I write, how should I do it. And uh, so I think, well, it might be kind of interesting just to dig up a little bit about El Reno and uh, write it and get my grade to be done with it. So after giving it some thought, I checked with a few people and wondered, well, where could I go? Who could I talk with? What, where could I find this information other than in Oklahoma history books? And really, it wouldn't be a very detailed account of El Reno. So it was suggested that I visit uh, Mr. Merle Woods, who gave me a great, great lot of help and information. And uh, so I wrote my term paper, which consisted of what, eight or 10 pages, I suppose. But by that time, I had gotten real interested in this thing, and, and I found so much that was a, of a, uh, it was of great interest to me, and I think to many people. And may I add right at this point, whatever you know about Canadian County, El Reno, or anything else, write it down, for heaven's sakes, because uh, I know I, I went out to interview people. I talked to Mr. Paul Hensley, who passed away something like six months ago, or, or, uh, in the last few months, who uh, had a wealth of material and, uh, and a personal knowledge of many of the happenings in and around El Reno. Uh, Mrs. Sybil Thomas, I don't know any of you remember her. Ann Garner gave me a great deal of help. Uh, R.B. Cobb, I believe it was, just a number of people that I visited, and I, I thoroughly enjoyed every minute of it. And so I went a little further and, and wrote another history, and much of it I got from these people and, and readings that, that I did. Uh, and when uh, asked to do this, you know, I um, never want to say no, I guess. Maybe I should sometime. <laughs> but uh, um, Mr. and Mrs. Ball asked me if I would come over and discuss the run. I said, sure, I'd be happy to. And uh, so I got to thinking, well, you know, what do you say about a run? I mean, they, they did it. <laughs> they came in there every way possible. I thought in, in, uh, in presenting it, I, I feel like it's pretty important that we go back just a little farther than run because there are many events that led to the opening in the unassigned lands or over Oklahoma. Um, Canadian County was a part of it. In fact, uh, if you'll notice, I have some maps here of Oklahoma and you can see what it looked like. Uh, it belonged to a couple of three Indian tribes uh, in, uh, or maybe four, uh, in about 1803 to 1836. And then it was expanded, and of course, uh, we came up in the Cherokee outlet. And the government did much to move the Indians from other parts of the country. And uh, most of the time, against their will, they weren't really interested in, in coming into Oklahoma. But uh, the government, uh, from all indications I got, thought it was a pretty good idea because they were heckling the white people quite a bit with their little war party. So, Anyway, we'll go back. I hope that doesn't fall. I think it's going to. I think we'll go back about 70 years preceding the run, 75. Uh, what is now Oklahoma. And uh, 
uh, there was a couple of uh, chiefs, William McIntosh and another one. Anyway, they made the treaty, and they really didn't go to their um, their people and ask their advice on the thing, but they went ahead and signed it. Of course, as a result, uh, they, uh, a band of the warriors from that tribe uh, found them in a house, and they set it fire, and they tried to escape by they were shot right then and there. So uh, they did get kind of ornery about things like moving to Oklahoma. And they really didn't feel like the two men uh, represented their entire tribe. Then the, uh, the uh, Treaty of Washington was then signed. They, they tried to get the Indians back together, the Creeks, and uh, again attempt to move them to Oklahoma. And so they did sign the Treaty of Washington, but it took something like six years to 1832 before they, they uh, had completed the move of the Creeks into what, uh, and, the, and part of this is Canadian County, uh, where the Creeks were. And they, uh, uh, also the year eight, 1832, there were several of the Seminole chiefs came into Oklahoma, the government was dealing with them and wanting to, to move to Oklahoma, but they really didn't like the idea, but said, well, we'll come to Oklahoma and we'll look it over, and if we like it, then we might move. So they came and they met three government agents, and uh, government agents talked with them a while and asked them how they liked the land. So they gave them a piece of paper to sign, and anyway, this paper uh, did uh, give up all their lands in Florida. And uh, so the, uh, the chiefs went back, and of course their people were very upset about it. In fact, they, they declared war on the whites and uh, had, uh, had quite a time. But uh, anyway, they, they contended that they signed uh, a paper that said we liked the lands, but they didn't want to give up their, their lands in, in Florida. <coughs> The uh, uh, year 1866, the Creeks agreed to free their slaves. Again, this was uh, was by treaty, and uh, of course the Seminoles and Creeks were somewhat together. But uh, the, uh, the Creeks were located mostly in the eastern portion of this land because there were many Plains Indians out in here, and and they. Uh, also found that there's more abundance of water to the east of us and rather than to the west. So they stayed in, uh, in that portion. They, uh, anyway, the Treaty of 1866, they agreed to free their slaves and adopt them into the tribe and grant right of, the right of way for railroads to come down through the country. And uh, anyway, about the, the half of their lands, which was this, portion right here. You can see where they, the Creeks uh, retained this land in the eastern, eastern part of Oklahoma. Uh, anyway, they said, we want to give it to other tribes of friendly Indians. And of course, uh, a lot of the stories I read of Indians in Oklahoma, some of them were too friendly. Uh, anyway, they moved them in here, but they, the Creeks did receive 30 cents an acre for the, all of this land from the government. Well, this this portion. But uh, anyway, the stipulation was to go to other Indians and, and make home. Then in 1869, about 200 Cheyennes were moved from Montana and, and the Dakotas. And of course, the Cheyenne uh, Indians were wanderers. And they called them horse Indians because they had many ponies and and they did wander a lot. And the Arapahoes were moved down into to this area, and uh, they uh, they weren't as warlike as the Cheyenne, although they had their problems too. Uh, when all this moving was taking place, of course, the uh, uh, Brent and Darlington established uh, what is now known as Darlington in 1869, and uh, Brent Darlington was uh, a Quaker, uh, an Iowa Quaker, and uh, the government had appointed several, or uh, whatever they had hired or appointed, 
several of the uh, Quakers to be Indian agents. Now they felt like a lot of the Indians were pretty warlike, and the Quakers, of course, were very um, unwarlike, I guess we could call them. And <clears throat> they felt like it would, uh, this would have great influence on the Indians. Now, excuse me, some accounts I've read, they, uh, they were, uh, very much an influence on the Indians. Some say no, they probably didn't do any better than the others, so it is a kind of a debatable thing. And uh, uh, anyway, back to the, the uh, Darlington Agency itself, of course, most of you know where the game farm is located at this time. Of course, it has changed hands several times. It was the uh, Indian Agency had sold the Masons in 1920 for an old folks' home and children's home. And then it was converted to a drug addict farm and then later to a quail hatchery in its, uh, in its state today. Now, near the, as you can see, near the center of, the, uh, of Oklahoma, a something shield-shaped, they call it, a uh, tract of land of about two million acres. That was, to give, uh, that was given up by the Creeks and the Seminole Indians in the Treaty of 1866 as a home for Indians that uh, were friendly and needed a home, a place that they could stay. And uh, it was also suggested land be used to place the, the uh, former slaves of five civilized tribes on this land. But uh, this was never carried out. Now, again, we refer the Unassigned lands for old Oklahoma. Now that's mainly what we're dealing with tonight. But long before 1889, when uh, white pioneers brought their herds of cattle into the uh, Indian lands for pasturage, and of course they they had quite a problem there in that the Indians uh, they'd run a little short on buffalo, so they'd go out and find a few cattle and. And then uh, the ranchers, the cattle, uh, or the uh, ranchers and the uh, Indians were into it. Well, anyway, the, some of the ranchers went to the government and asked that, uh, that maybe they pass some kind of a law uh, or make it legal for the uh, ranchers to, to uh, deal with the Indians and uh, uh, rent the land or bargain with them some way or another, but the government says, no, we'll have nothing to do with it. Uh, if you want to deal with the Indians, fine. But what would happen, they'd go out and make some kind of a deal. They'd go out, put their cattle on the, the grazing land, they'd build a few ranches, and the first thing they knew, why the Indians come along, quit the barbed wire, and, and then the war was on again. So the government ended up, they'd have to come in, they'd chase the rancher back to Texas, and back and forth it went for a, a number of years. But the, uh, no, I think you just leave it there. Why don't you put that thing so, I'll tell you what let's do. I'm going to lay that thing just right here so that bottom will hang out. Before the, the actual run to open the unassigned land, well, there, there were many efforts on behalf of people to try to get this thing open. Now, I, I look back and, uh, and I think, well, possibly there are several things that, that were involved. And one, of course, the Chisholm Trail divided and uh, came through this uh, part of the county. And uh, you know that uh, the Canadian Valley is probably some of the most enticing land that you'll find any place. I'm sure the cattlemen and uh, people who pass through Oklahoma recognize this.
this. So they were they were very eager to to open this land and get a part of it if they possibly could. So there were many efforts, and uh, and the first being that of the Boomers, and uh, they they were called Boomers because they were going to come booming into the new lands, and and certainly they did. But every time when well, they were chased away. Uh, a few were Indians, Elias Boudinot, uh, Cherokee was one of the, the starters of the Boomer movement. And uh, he wrote many pamphlets and he drew maps of this land and he sent it all over the country, had it published in newspapers, and was really instrumental in, in, uh, in getting something started. Then he seemed to inspire many people and as a result, a leader by the name of C.C. Carpenter formed groups of people to go into the unassigned lands and choose homesteads. They, of course, the troops were quickly summoned and, and sent to the Kansas border and stopped the effort. Uh, a few that had crossed, well, they were returned to Kansas. Then in 1880, the Boomers secured a new leader, David L. King, a cousin of David Crockett. And and of course, David set it up a little different. He charged a two dollar fee, and, and he was going to do a lot of publicizing, and, and this guaranteed to all the people that belonged to the Boomers there the full protection of the Boomer colony. Uh, this is one of the handbills that David Payne used in uh, trying to get people to uh, join the Boomer movement. This is a reproduction, and there were other pamphlets or leaflets that were handed out, Chief Holmes, David L. Payne. Uh, the, the gathering of 1880, Payne, uh, well, they met in Arkansas City, and he had over 600 men and many women and children that were ready to come into the unsigned lands. And, uh, of course, they had gotten everything ready to go, and then here came the troops, and they stopped the movement. <coughs> but uh, during the next few years, Payne would lead as many as two to three parties into the, or attempt to come into the Indian or the unassigned uh, lands. But each time, the troops, uh, they were on to him, and, and they threw him right back into Kansas. Then in 1884, he had a pretty good sized colony together, and again, he was going to come, but he became ill, and he passed away within just a few days in Wellington, Kansas. Then a new leader of the Boomers, Captain W.L. Couch, I think Couch and Payne are probably recognized as two of the great ones of the Boomer movement. Uh, uh, Couch was Payne's friend and helper, and had helped him a great deal in some of his movements. Then uh, he led a large party in Oklahoma and settled near the side of Stillwater. They actually got in and, and settled down for a little bit, but then here came the troops again. And, uh, and then that was the last organized attempt or the end of the Boomer movement to get into the unassigned lands. Then they, uh, they actually went about it in the right way. After all their attempts were, were uh, then they thought, well, there's only one way left, and that's go to Washington. And uh, so the struggle began, and bill after bill was uh, put up and introduced in Congress, but the Creeks came back and, and uh, they declared they had ceded their part of the lands to the United States uh, for 30 cents an acre to be used for other Indian homes. And the Seminoles, they they uh, began to say the same thing, and they had sold out for 15 cents an acre. So the United States then, or Congress, decided, well, they would go ahead and pay the Creeks two and a quarter million dollars in the Seminoles, approximately two million. So then when Congress met in, eight, in December of 1888, a bill opening the Oklahoma lands for settlement was offered. It was known as the Springer Bill. And it passed the House but failed the Senate. And so they were in great turmoil around Washington. What do we do? How do we get it open? What have you? So they attached this bill. They changed it and made it a rider. And uh, 
attached to an Indian appropriation bill, one that was to pay all of the Indian uh, bills throughout the, the United States. And so it passed. And uh, it simply stated that the Oklahoma lands should be open to settlement in such manner as the president might direct. It passed and, uh, and uh, was signed by President Grover Cleveland in March of 1889. Then two days later, President Benjamin Harrison took office. And uh, March the 23rd, he issued the proclamation which was open these lands. And it declared that at noon, April 22nd, 1889, these lands would be open to settlement under the Homestead Laws of the United States. States. Section 16 and 36 in each township were to be withheld for school land. Of course, uh, when the, the news spread, why then the people began to make plans to come into the unassigned land. They wanted a, a little hunk of Oklahoma. And by, by April the 22nd, it's been estimated that some 50,000 people were camped along the border of the Oklahoma land. Of course, they lived in tents, covered wagons. A lot of them thought, well, get there first and get them all. But it wasn't that way. And they had very strict rules uh, under which everyone must abide. They, uh, if a horse or a mule strayed out across the, the line where they were, or the border, then they could send their, their child or wife or someone that was not going to stake a claim. Because one of the rules, if uh, if you cross the line, regardless of the reason, then you would not get to stake a claim in the new lands. So uh, they were pretty, uh, they guarded this thing pretty carefully, of course. We then uh, get into another little thing, and that's uh, something about the Sooners. Um, now, this is this is rather interesting. See, a, a, a change was taking place in names. Now then, the boomers who followed uh, Payne, Couch, and some of them, no longer called themselves boomers. They became known as Sooners because they had been here sooner than anybody else. And uh, they, uh, uh, one, well, one, one thing I had uh, read said that uh, uh, the name Sooner meant that they had sooner be here than any place else. And of course, uh, another meaning, uh, uh, Sooner, many of them hid in the, in the gullies or in the bushes, different place, places, and waited uh, for the lands to open. And about the time the others started coming along, about the right time, then they jump out and stake their claim. And, and here they go running to the, the homestead office, and they were all fixed up. But anyway, they, by coming in early, while well, they could get some pretty choice spots, I'm sure. Uh, every conceivable means of transportation could be found, lying and waiting to come into the unassigned lands. And every one of them just waiting for the cannon to boom and the six guns to fire. They knew they were going to really go. In fact, one uh, author that I read said it was kind of like a big, big game, and the stakes were uh, 160 acres of good land. And so everybody came from all over the nation. And by dinner time on April the 22nd, 1889, many, many uh, cities had sprouted from the prairies. When they fired that gun, and here they came. Uh, the city in Reno City, Frisco, El Reno, Oklahoma City, and many others. And uh, the, uh, they, they said in coming down, one, one thing uh, that I thought was rather interesting, that a lot of them came by train, of course they were riding bicycles, and some of them took the front wheels off of their, uh, their covered wagon and they made just a seat between two of them with an axle, and and a horse and the way they'd go, but it's a little bit rough riding, I'm sure. The, uh, the trains were required to slow down a great deal because it would be unfair if they were to come roaring down through there and uh, outrun all of the, the, the stations.
stage coaches or whatever was coming through, so they were required to do that. But anyway, most of the settlers were real fire-minded people. They were hard-working people. They came in here to make an honest living. Of course, with them came many, many other people. Uh, they were here to make an honest living, but maybe not quite the same way because we had uh, our share of the gamblers and the the uh, racketeers, and they were coming right along with the settlers. But uh, anyway, that's all a part of the pioneer spirit. One of the uh, one of the proudest things I think probably an old kid say, and in particular in this part of the country, is that my folks were 89. And the state making the best of its beginnings calls itself the Center State. I think everyone is proud to be a Center. That's uh, pretty much what I had on the, the run, and I understand that uh, everybody gets to share in this thing. Is that right, Ms. Ball? And, uh, pardon? We like to have everybody yeah. share. <laughs> uh, I have a number of other things that uh, when we finished with the run, I'd like to point out. How do you conduct this thing? Just say, okay, who wants to talk? Okay. I know that a number of you came prepared to talk tonight. Tell us about the run. I don't remember much about it, or I'd tell you much. <laughs> <laughs> yes, Mary. Northeast quarter of 1211 6. 
We then hurried back to Darlington, and though very uneasy about our possessions, found that we had left our wagon in the care of an honest Indian. Feeling generous, we gave him 50 cents. <laughs> when you get farther down, you'll find out that 50 cents was more than we think it is now. Uh, next day, we returned to Kingfisher to file on our land, but could not file for two weeks on account of the great rush. So I went back to Kansas on horseback and came back later to file. My brother-in-law, with team and wagon, stayed with our claims and broke sod until July. In November, he returned to Kansas. We moved to the Radcliffe claim in a covered wagon and had lots of company early in 1890. People were going to many different parts of the new country to set up a residence on their claims as required by law. Our first house was 12 by 16 feet, three feet dugout, and four feet of sod. The roof was a brush, slew grass, and sod. That first year, 1890, our crops were cotton and corn, but the corn didn't amount to much, as corn crops are now sometimes. Turnips, watermelons, pie melons, and so forth. The latter grew wild. Our first post office was Thurston. The mail route was from El Reno by the way of Liberty Post Office. And Alec Spencer was our postmaster. <coughs> he also kept a small stock of groceries and notions, which he freighted from Oklahoma City with a team of mules. His little store was quite a convenience to people of our community. Our neighbors included Mr. and Mrs. Reuben Fry, that was uh, Bob Fry's grandfather, Miss Tully McCormick, uh, Mr. and Mrs. R. M. Fry, that's Bob's father and mother, Andy Wedman, Sister Rosa Wedman, Mr. and Mrs. William McKenzie, and Mr. and Mrs. Frank McKinney. Our first schoolhouse was of sod, and we also had Sunday school and preaching there. Everybody enjoyed going, it being their main social activity. On July 4, 1890, quite a number from the surrounding country gathered in a low grove on Mustang Creek, five miles south of Yukon. Alex Spencer gave the Independence Day address, and we had violin and organ music. We had baskets filled with the best our good women could provide, which included barbecued beef. All, as folks say, everybody had a good time. I worked now and then as a carpenter for one dollar per day. That wasn't in the eight-hour day either. <laughs> uh, we, uh, we hauled our firewood from Council Grove, the government reserve timberland. I bought corn and hauled it from a Mr. Bonds in the Chickasaw Nation. Now that was over on the south side of the South Canadian River. And, uh, and that this claim was four miles south of Yukon and one mile west. Uh, I think Frank's son farmed in that. And Sarah Day and I, when we started housekeeping, lived on that place. <laughs> Yes, I have. Mine uh, is kind of backward. She uh, didn't say back, so not back. <laughs> <laughs> that, that is better. She also said she had a sore throat. So she asked me to 
read this. Uh, this also was one of that series that Mr. Carter carried in the American. Uh, I don't know how many there were those, uh, but he had a little contest. And, uh, and Marie. Pardon me? Oh, yes, this, this is by Marie. Uh, uh, I'm uh, Mr. Carter did have a series, uh, and I think there's at least ten. Uh, scattered from all over the county. But that's right. Ray Lyons, who is also still working for me as bookkeeper, uh, is uh, uh, a time as a society editor for, and as, as well as bookkeeper. And she interviewed uh, uh, the Mr. and Mrs. Joel uh, H. Lyons. Um, she was married to Carl Lyons, uh, uh, Bina's brother. And uh, so she uh, was so impressed with their uh, uh, experiences that she uh, interviewed them and wrote this article. On a farm two miles east of Del Reno is a ramshackle one-room house, shaky and unstable. The wind whispers through its frame, filled with memories both pleasant and sorrowful. It tells a poignant story. Not long ago, the owner considered tearing it down, but his wife protested. It had stood there 42 years, and to her was a symbol of a grim but glorious past. The little house was her home in the pioneer days. The man and his wife were Mr. and Mrs. Joe H. Lyons, brought to Arena. On April 27, 1891, Ida Louise Kemper, accompanied by her brother Spencer E. Kemper, now deceased, arrived in Canadian County from Lincoln, Nebraska by train to make their home in Oklahoma. This strange new country was filled with hardships and wonder for this young girl and her brother, a country so new that only two graves had been filled in its lonely cemetery, which was located then as it is now. That refers to the Arena Cemetery uh, out east of town. One of those graves held the body of a Mr. Brady, whose tragic end is well known to the 89ers. The other cradled the body of the Tustin boy, who died of typhoid fever in October 1889. Mrs. Lyons first came to this country in 1890 with her father, H.K. Kemper of Lincoln, now deceased. The object of their visit was to purchase a claim. They bought the relinquishment of Mr. McCoy. Now many of the these first uh, people who settled, stayed on the claims, uh, decided to give up the ghost and uh, sold their uh, claims to those called relinquishments. And so they bought the relinquishment of Mr. McCoy, who sold for the reason that he was quite old and wished to retire. A few months later, with her brother, the daughter came back to live on this claim, and she has lived there ever since. On the trip to Oklahoma, the brother and two sisters, and her brother and sister brought two cows, two mules, two hogs, and 12 chickens, their household furniture and watchdog. They hauled water from the George Lamb place, north across the road, all summer, but in the fall dug a well out of the, uh, we dug well of their own. Now, George Lamb, might be interesting to mention, was uh, a Scotsman who lived to be 100 years old. Uh, he came in here and staked a farm out southeast of El Reno, but then he got a chance to uh, buy uh, the one uh, right on the east edge of El Reno, the old ranch property. Uh, that's where the big building is. Uh, it's out there, Otis Cox owns, uh, owns the home now. But uh, George Lamb bought, uh, bought that land, and when they had the, the lot jumping in El Reno, uh, George, or, or rather when they organized the town, the townside company, they employed George to plow the street markings. And uh, uh, he, he plowed, plowed up the uh, show, show the blocks and the location of the different uh, parts of the town. And another interesting thing about, uh, uh, about old George was that uh, uh, 
he uh, never was paid for the job. And so uh, he kept uh, after this town site company, who was composed of Fort Reno officers and uh, some uh, uh, railroad men, Rock Island railroad men. So he kept after them to pay them to, for uh, all that work he'd done. And uh, they kept stalling him off and stalling him off. So uh, one day he took his shotgun and went down to the place where the city, First National Bank is now located. And he said, this is my lot. And uh, so immediately the townside company sent an officer over to escort him off the lot. And he refused to go. And he uh, pulled out a shotgun to uh, stand, stand up to his word. And so they argued back and forth, back and forth all day long. Finally, long towards the evening, they uh, came back and said, well, we're going to let you keep this lot. He, later, he sold it. Uh, so. so this uh, tells that they, they hold water from the George Land place across the road all summer in her fall, they dug the well of their own. Mrs. Lyons regularly walked the two miles from her home to church in El Reno each Sunday morning, and in the evening walked the distance again to accompany her brother to church. McCoy had moved the little one-room house, which still stands at, at its farm location, from Reno City. The campers curtained it off to form a cozy two-room house and settled down to the business of farming, raising wheat the first year. When the harvest time came, it brought a shy neighbor boy to help the brother with his work. Mrs. Lyons admits that she never once dreamed at that time that she had met her fate. This new assistant was Joe Lyons, whom she later married. In a cart drawn by a mule, they conveyed their groceries and other supplies from the town to their home, where they farmed 30 acres of the 160. The farm has since been reduced to 68 acres, which the family still farms. Their earliest neighbors were Mr. Lamb, Bill Phelps, A. Mason, George D. Smith, J.R. Musgrove, father of Carl and Clyde Musgrove. Clyde, by the way, was uh, editor of the uh, El Reno News, which was the forerunner of the El Reno American. It was established in 1896. Sam Martin, father of Mrs. Val Andrews, Frank Butler, Lewis Richmond, Hart Whaley, Thomas Cooksey, Dr. A. H. Jackson, and others. Many nights, a coyote howled outside their windows, and Indian drove past going from El Reno to Oklahoma City. Joe Lyons lived one mile east of the Kemper farm on the fame of his brother Dick Lyons. A little too young at the time to take up a fame in his own name, he had come to the new country from Philadelphia, Pennsylvania in September 1889 at the request of his brother to take care of his farm. His brother had come to Fort Reno in 1885 from Fort Sydney, Nebraska, having been transferred with the 5th Cavalry of the United States Army. The young Irish boy came from Pennsylvania to Oklahoma City by train starting on Monday morning and arriving Thursday night. He made the trip from Oklahoma City to Fort Reno by stage. In a two-room house, he batched on, on his brother's claim. His first crop, an average crop, was 20 acres of corn. His earliest memory of a post office places a location near the present Central Drug Store. Uh, that's where Youngheim is now located, I believe. And he recalls that the Hickox girl was clerk. Uh, uh, Reuben Hickox was the first postmaster. Reverend Light was the first preacher he remembers. Reverend Light was the man, I think, who established the first Methodist church here. On November 25, 1892, Ida Kemper and Joe Lyons were married by Justice of Peace John Fox in El Reno, and in a buggy drove to Okarchi for the honeymoon trip. <laughs> At the ceremony were Webb S. Waldron, father of Miss Nellie Waldron, and Joe R. Waldron of El Reno, and Harry Waldron of uh, Wichita, Kansas, and Walter J. Clark, 92 <coughs> South Barker Avenue. Uh, to prove up a claim whose relinquishment Mr. Lyons had bought from the man who staked it, they went to Lawton in May 1902 in a covered wagon. 
They remained there a month in August, returned for another month, and in October made the trip to Lawton again, where they remained until they proved up the place. I don't know why they had to go to Lawton to uh, prove, uh, <coughs> prove up, because Kingfish was the... Well, that's that's the drawing. Oh, that's right. That, 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 that explains it. Yes. Mr. Lyons, pardon me? Uh, there was two different places where they had the pot. One was in the back in that lot and here in Alvarino. And that's here in Alvarino. But the actual drawing was here in Alvarino. The register is both lost and Alvarino, but the actual drawing was, uh, was that on Irving School uh, out the uh, grounds in Alvarino. Yeah, well, I guess you're right. That's on, uh, it's on August 6th, uh, 1901. Mr. Lyons recalls that they dug nine wells but never found water and had to fall it two miles. They later sold the farm at Lawton and devoted their time to Canadian County. Mr. Lyons was born May 26, 1869 in Ireland and his wife was born October 13, 1869 at Lincoln. Now you know all about uh, Vina's uh, uh, parents. Their children, all of whom are grown and living, are Joseph C. St. Louis, Henry J. of Enid, Earl M. Kirk Lyons of Tulsa, Miss Vina Lyons, now that is Mrs. Sangster, of El Reno, or of Enid, it says here at that time, Carl Lyons, Oklahoma City, Miss E. S. Davenport Barnstall, Tom C. Ivan, and Edwin Lyons of the home. I'm sure Vina could tell us a lot more if she wasn't so bashful. Uh, I'd like to say one more thing. Uh, before I sit down, uh, Gene, uh, you mentioned that Del Reno was uh, staked during the opening. Uh, that's a slight mistake, an error by about a week or two, because uh, Reno City was actually opened uh, as a town site, whereas El Reno uh, wasn't open until uh, early in early in June or early in April uh, or in May, rather, and. Uh, uh, by the, this town site company. Violet, do you want to add anything to that? Mm -hmm. No, I didn't know. Didn't, didn't that little part of the building is from Reno City all over here? That oh, yeah. Caddo Hotel, which used to stand down here on. Yes, Caddo Hotel and the, the old courthouse. It's pictured the old courthouse uh, here. A uh, number of other buildings. <coughs> Tony Kierkegaard's father came to Denmark. I, I've heard he does some really interesting tales. Would you tell some of Tony? Uh, my father came came here from Denmark, and when I he passed away when I was just really young, and to those things that he told me at that time never didn't amount to much to me because I never figured it'd be worth much. But uh, he came across, he taught school in Denmark before he left there and came across and uh, he had just taken out his citizenship papers before this run was supposed to be. So uh, he was in Omaha, Nebraska. He was unloading carloads of coal there to get enough money to, to make this run into the Oklahoma. Well, he made the run on an Indian pony, and uh, when he came to the North Canadian River, he was thinking deftly about staking a claim close to the river bottom in that good land. But the river was out of its banks, and he didn't think that would be too good a place to stake a claim. So it was about uh, near as I could recall where he crossed the river, was about straight south of Frisco and went on in south of Banner and staked his claim there. And that's where most of the of that crew that he was with, of course, he only met up with two or three that he really knew that got acquainted with him, that went in there and staked it on these ponies. And he said they, they didn't have enough nerve to ride these ponies across the river. They got off and swam beside the ponies. And the pony get away from them, they catch them with the tail and catch up again. But he said that it was pretty rough sledding across that river. And uh, I don't know, Mabel, did you ever show this uh, 
list of Sanders? No, I was looking at it, but it didn't bring it. You, well, uh, this I'm, is, she I'm had made this up, and it's been a lot of work. And there's a few pages here that I had a full study copy made of it. She made this up. And it is the homesteader, the date of entry, the charter, and the entry of all the homesteaders. And this is all in south six and east six. of Banner. Oh, and I, I don't know why this wouldn't be a good thing to put in historically. But and I would like to give it back to her so she can present it to you. <laughs> <laughs> maybe a new Roy star and uh, he had he had this original that was it was a copy that, that <coughs> his father-in-law had got up at Kingfisher and uh, it tells a lot of names on here that there a lot of the older people would be familiar with <coughs> and I was uh, very much surprised when I got down the line here and um, number 22 and uh, read our own son's name. <laughs> and, but I don't think that uh, that Grandpa ever knew anybody that you didn't know people as far away then as you do now. So. Uh, this, this is a copy you had made, yes, you? so you still have. All right, who, who gets this? You? Uh, Mrs. Renderhagen here in her folks came to Germany. I think <laughs> Mrs. Renderhagen did tell us that one. I came from a big town, twice as big as a from a city in the mountain, and come from a town like El Reno, and as we walked through the sidewalk, we stepped in one and two, one and in one and two, and I thought, what well, in town, I tried to have time, I want to go back, <laughs> but thank goodness we stayed for the night. Well, I, I'd have been prepared. I could have said something, but I just can't because, yes, my the harm to stay they were, yes, they were the relatives, they were the ones that stayed and got my father-in-law. And they lived on this place where I lived. I went some other time and I said, Betty, you don't need to ride now and I just can't. Well, I can't go back to my father. Yeah, this is Mr. Kirk. Kirk. Yes, Mr. Kirk. Pardon me, go ahead. Yeah, Mr. Kirk. Yes, 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 Mr.
and I knew of one person that told me how her father drove up to the to the empty claim and stopped his team and said, well, here's home. <laughs> and then they took the top of, the top part off of the covered wagon and set it on the ground and used that for a home until they could get their study bill. I can hear you. Dallas, mm -hmm. probably out there, and the Dow boys live out there. 
But anyway, that's where they settled, and uh, she went to Harmony School and all her brothers. And Gussie Dow has Gussie Dow father, Gus Thielen, is on the school board, and she has the book, the register, where these children's names are all in it. And my mother's and several of her brothers and her sister's names are in there. All the two youngest ones in the family are in that book. But anyway, my father came over from Germany when he was 17, and he and his brother, Uncle, Uncle Von Rierbelt, they worked for Mr. Thielen out there on that farm, and uh, oh my, it was pitiful how <laughs> they worked for such a little bit of money, and their room and board, of course. My father then had never been on the farm, knew nothing about it. I remember him telling this. I'm mixing it up with my mother coming to Oklahoma, but he came to Oklahoma too soon after she did. <laughs> But anyway, he even didn't know any better than to go out and plow with a walking plow with a white shirt on. He didn't have nothing else. <laughs> so Mr. Thielen went to town and got him some clothes. But anyway, going back to Mother telling about her folks, which is what I want to tell. My grandfather had this oxen team, and he would drug a log and made the first road in that neighborhood that they could have a road, you know, to travel. And um, they lived in a dugout, and uh, then they planted peach trees. They brought seeds with them from Kansas. They had come from western Kansas. They got all their crops all dried up out there. They didn't have anything. And they brought these peach seeds. I don't know where they got them, but they had some peach seeds. <laughs> and my mother said that her father had this oxen team, and he uh, plowed a furrow, and she walked behind and dropped peach seeds. And they had to plant them in the fall, and they had to stay in the ground all winter. stay in the ground all winter and freeze before they would grow. And I never knew that. And mm -hmm. so that was, I thought, interesting. But anyway, they had a pretty hard time. <laughs> and there was quite a large family of them. And my mother and father got married quite young. He was 19 and she was <coughs> 14 and a half. <coughs> she always said, Jenny, don't forget that half. <laughs> <laughs> I forgot to mention that parents had a store out on that farm for the place to watch for it before Kay Matt was built. Mm -hmm. And they had quite a few uh, ex uh, scary uh, experiences with the outlaws and Indians. I want to tell just a little bit more about something else I wanted to tell. And I shouldn't do this. But um, <laughs> anyway, when I was born, I was born in Oklahoma. And of course, uh, my father, of course, was farming out there for Mr. Ishaw, for Mr. Theoner, farming with them. And I guess he had to share the crop or something. And he worked with them some way. But he had a team of horses in a wagon. And uh, I was a little baby. And my mother's folks lived close by, you know. And so they just didn't have anything, no food. So Papa comes to El Reno, and he uh, takes his team in his wagon. He hauls beer from here to Fort Reno, and uh, to the commissary, I guess, or whatever they called it in the days. And uh, that's the way he got along. And he said, and, and Mother told me all of this, and Papa, I've heard him talk about it too. He um, didn't spend any of that money. I think he got... Uh, I don't know, it was such a little bit. But he saved every bit of his money. And uh, he would, all the food he got was what he'd snatch in the saloons. Those days, he said, they had cheese and crackers and 
pretzels or what we call pretzels now, I guess, to have on the counter for them to help themselves to. So he'd go through and get him something, you know, and he'd munch on that. He slept in in the wagon yard or wherever they bedded their horses for the night. He laid on the hay by the horses. That's where he slept. He saved every bit of his money. He bought some groceries and went back home, got his wife and baby and went back to his little rented place. And, and that's the way they got along those days. So I've heard some pretty tough stories, too. <laughs> so we can be thankful for what we've got today. Well, I'll add my little bit. My grandfather, Mr. G.H. Shields, came uh, in 1892 from Kansas and uh, made the run and he staked a claim just about a mile west of where Mr. Howe's parents uh, finally uh, lived. He went back to Kansas after his family. My mother was 13 when they came. They came in covered wagons, came in September and they lived in those covered wagons until they had got their little uh, dugout made with a little lean-to on one side and uh, there were six children in the family and my grandfather and grandmother and my grandfather's mother and father and later then they built a little frame uh, room up above the dugout and that little house still stands out on that claim where uh, they staked. So I have heard my mother tell uh, many a story about when they came. Then my grandfather ran a freight wagon from El Reno out to Clinton and, and on beyond, and we have pictures of his big freight wagon with all oh, two and three and four teams uh, of horses so hauling freight, and that's the way he helped make their Gene, I'd like to add one more point of history. Uh, uh, Miss Ball called me today and wanted to know where the 98th Radian uh, was located. Well, it's, this, this is the 98th Radian here. And uh, here in El Reno, it's just about a block and a half west of this point. It comes, it's on that street right uh, or between the, the old depot, our old museum, and uh, the Southern Hotel there. Uh, I think the exact location is probably in that little park to the east side of the depot. And uh, extending that on north, Highway 81, uh, after you get around the curve there of the city water plant, you run into the 98th meridian, and from there on north, it, uh, uh, the highway is on the meridian. Uh, it passes to the east of Okarchi. And, uh, the reason it is, it is important in El Reno's history was that uh, um, the, the settlers lined up on the west side uh, in the opening of 1889 and ran to the east. Of course, Kingfisher was up in here and uh, a number of other towns, but uh, they lined up on the west side all along here. Of course, all the way around, they were lined up ready for the start. A lot of them came across the river from the south. But uh, as far as we're concerned, uh, El Reno was important because uh, they, uh, it was uh, settled by two different runs. The east half, uh, east half was settled, of course, by the uh, run of 89, and the west half, or the, what is now oh, the west half. Oh, should on that map, Merle. Should on that map, Well, I don't know whether that's plain enough that they can see. That, that dark mark up the middle is in the Oh, yes, that, that is in the and then uh, down at the bottom, that little uh, purple mark is the last, the third, below the river, in the river line. Oh, yeah. That, <coughs> no, back to your, see that line that goes across, that's the third one. And everything above that was the second one. That was the lottery down there. Oh, yes, there. I see. Uh, uh, this, this, this is all the time right mm -hmm. uh, This is how all the mansions are. Well, another uh, interesting thing, uh, was the Rock Island Railway originally was planned to come into El Reno east of the, the 98th Meridian and pass through uh, old Rock Island, the town of Rock Island, uh, Reno City, and uh, then come down Rock Island Street in El Reno, Rock Island Avenue rather. But uh, 
Uh, the Rock Island found out they were going to have to pay for the right of way. Some of the towns were there were planning to hold them up for right of way. So they, uh, they were permitted to uh, come through the Indian land without paying anything for it. However, they did have uh, reversionary rights. The Indians have a reversionary right, so the Rock Island never uh, discontinues that as a railroad. Uh, it, uh, it's supposed to go back to the Indians. And that's one reason the Rock Island couldn't give us title to, to the depot here. Uh, the depot is on Indian land. And uh, so we, we have it on a, uh, uh, a month-to-month basis. That's right. That killed, uh, just like uh, Frisco was killed when uh, uh, the East and West Railroad was built on the south side of the river. But uh, for some reason or other, from uh, uh, the depot on south, uh, they, Rock Island must have paid for the right-of-way because uh, uh, it uh, crosses over uh, uh, somewhere between uh, the depot, uh, uh, a little way south of the depot, crosses over into the, uh, uh, the lands which are uh, already settled. So they must have paid, paid for the right-of-way from here on south. You might be interested. The railroad charges is pretty high rent. We pay a dollar a year for our museum. <laughs> 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 well, of course, things getting kind of late. I'm not I'm anxious to get away, and you're tired of listening to me anyway. Uh, really, uh, we got up to the point uh, that I really did most of my research, and that was. Uh, at following the opening, tell who your teacher was. but uh, yeah, I was going to get to that. <laughs> uh, I mentioned that uh, that I uh, wrote this for an English class, and uh, none other than that of Miss Rose Witcher, uh, who was the, one of the grand ladies of El Reno, I feel. She was really one that inspired me as well as Merle Wood and some of the other people. So uh, I do give a great deal of credit to them. I think without them, I, I wouldn't have gone as far as I did. Um, I don't know what any of you have seen this. It's in the library, but it's entitled The History of El Reno. These are things that I've taken from other people. And, and uh, the other day, um, Mr. Ball asked me if it'd be possible to reproduce the thing and maybe sell it to make a little bit of money for the historical society and the museum, and certainly you have my full approval to do anything you want to do. I, uh, I know that it's just uh, a copy of things that I've read. There's no personal experiences in it. It's just a matter of trying to pull some of these things together, and I hope in readable form that uh, it comes out and would give you maybe some additional knowledge of this area particularly of El Reno, Reno City. I'd like to point out on some of the pictures that I've placed over here now. Uh, a lot of these are reproductions. In fact, most of them are the, the light ones I took myself back in 1954 when I was doing most of it. The first row of pictures all deal with Fort Reno. And I just brought a sampling of what I have uh, collected over the years. But anyway, uh, aerial view, this is Sheridan's headquarters. Uh, originally was at Fort Reno and is now out in the park. Um, this is while it was still at Fort Reno. The cemetery, Fort Reno, Ben Clark, uh, his tomb at uh, Fort Reno. This uh, picture is of Darlington in the background. This is Mr. Fred Ball. Maybe some of you remember Fred, who was an auctioneer in Canadian <laughs> County. Uh, Fred and I uh, toured Canadian County for about two days, I think. And he told me all about the different spots, and and I really uh, had a great deal and enjoyed visiting with it. This was taken at the Darlington Cemetery. This, uh, these newspaper clippings. This is the uh, uh, a church picture uh, out near Darlington. In fact, that's the uh, Mennonite Mission uh, here, and then the old Rathbone School at Darlington. This. Uh, I've been unable to identify for sure, but uh, I think it's a picture that was taken in Reno City, but that's as near as we get. This uh, was taken at the original site of Reno City. This is the old Caddo Hotel that was moved from Reno City into El Reno. And of course, as I understood it, it stayed in uh, 
fishing on the river all summer. All winter. Or all winter. Mm -hmm. And people still continue to live in it, but they have to go back and forth on the trestles. This um, annex, uh, well, this is across the street west from Dee's Tire Store, uh, the station there by House Chevrolet, was where the Cattle Hotel was located. The annex, annex to the Cattle Hotel was torn down approximately uh, 12 or 13 years ago. I don't remember the exact date, but it was located directly across west from the present telephone building. And uh, this was the old Mennonite Commission. Uh, this was all about early day El Reno schools. Here, by the way, one of the clipping that I took from the El Reno paper of Rose Witcher. And, uh, all of the uh, students and teachers honored her after her retirement from the Yukon, uh, Yukon, I get back to Yukon, from the El Reno Public School. Uh, I happened to be in, uh, uh, in the class that she retired from, so I feel pretty close to Ms. Rose. Uh, these pictures were all taken of the drawing in 1901, and this is probably one of the largest crowds El Reno has ever seen. See here. Here's your historical building right here. And uh, well, in fact, that was on the bulletin tonight. I think this one. But anyway, some of the scenes. This I won't uh, say anything about it other than it was a canteen. I understand that's your, uh, that'll be your program at your next meeting. Uh, then just some of the street scenes, the old fire station, and these men named are on the back of this in case some of you be interested. Mr. Claude Hensley is one of them, the fourth one to the right. Um, up here, just some street scenes. This is the old Einstein Hotel, I believe that was originally the Del, Del Norte. Del Norte. Uh, and uh, it was built uh, at the time that uh, the Cattle Hotel was still out on the river. Um, and uh, anyway, it was a flourishing one. This is the uh, courthouse, which was located at the present side of Dee's Tire Store. And uh, it's also the, there's a little annex back here, and that's where they housed Al Jennings when he was elected as county attorney in 1892. And uh, of course, that was a colorful era. And, and as I understand, uh, Al, uh, Al's brother was killed in a gunfight. He didn't like the way the trial turned out, so he became an outlaw rather than county attorney. And this is the courthouse, which was torn down recently. This is a picture before, before and after of Kelso's, um, old Pierce era car, the Choctaw Rail uh, engine. And uh, then I lost one of my pictures today, but I got another one. The building still there. It was the old BPOE Hall. I'm sure that most of you recall that that was exhibited at, at the uh, St. Louis World's Fair in 1902. Four. Four. Okay, 1904. Uh, well, I had 19-2 on there, I thought I wondered. But uh, anyway, they dismantled it and brought it to El Reno and set it up and it's still being used today. Uh, street scene. Anyway, they're here and just looking at them. By the way, I'm playing together a lot of my pictures and articles together. And Pretty soon he said a bad record, 36th and 
May Avenue, people hurting all these wrecks, you know, and he kept going there, and I started turning around and come on home. <laughs> but I got on over there and got to a meeting, got out, and took me an hour to get out of a parking lot over there, <laughs> messing around. So I was grateful to get back home, so I'm like you. I'd sooner be here than over there. <laughs> I got to go back tomorrow, but after that, but they're going to have a hard time getting me back over there because it's, uh, I think I've just got too much country in me. I like it over here. That was a wonderful program, and all of you that participated with Gene, and we sure thank you. And uh, we'll remember all of these things that you volunteered for our museum. It'll be wonderful to have. Uh, Mr. Paul, do you have any about your future program? You told them. I've already now, where is that meeting you want to be next month? You say now, what you talked about different. Uh, well, it'll be publicized. Merle mentioned I'll have a fence. It's going to be the Red Cross and the canteen. If we can get chairs down there. Well, if Merle, can you get them in there now with all the with chairs, cases and all that's in there and all that it be? Uh -huh. Plain room. Yeah, it's the only thing we'll have to have a loud speaker speaking system of some kind rigged up there. But I think well, we'll when you find out then, uh, then yeah. they'll have it in the paper something. I, I see our treasurer finally walk in. It's taking him all evening there about an hour late to count the money we got. So maybe he'd like to uh, give a look. Is that what you've been? Or do you have a better excuse? $2,040. Huh? $2,040. Is there anything other? Anything else you have to report? Ruth, I wish you'd help get your brother here on time at the next meeting. Would you help us? Well, I'm hiring for you. I'm Sir? I was hired to come my preacher over church house. <laughs> <laughs> that takes time. <laughs> Did you get him hired? Yeah. Well, that's fine. Uh, <coughs> since he started talking about church, uh, I was over to Mother's church the other night, and he told a story, and he used the Mother's church, but I'll use, we were talking about the older and grandfathers and all this and that, and, and this minister from Dallas said that he asked a fellow what church he belonged to, so I'll change the churches around and use mine at the last there. That, that he said, why well, I'm a Methodist. He said, well, why? He said, because my father was and my grandfather was and his father and went on down. He said, well, that necessarily doesn't uh, mean that you have to be, does it? He said, what if they were idiots? He said, well, then I'd have been a Presbyterian. <laughs> <laughs> so. How many, how many of you were, how many people here were born in Canadian County? Say, there's quite a little few of us in there. Well, that is really something. That's, uh, that's a lot of folks. I think, uh, I think we should have a, a board meeting. Let's have it on, on Tuesday of next week, on the 21st at the depot, and find out what we need to have done before third and all those things. And by the way, they we're opening on the third, but one of the school teachers called and going wants to take her little school class down and then the lots out the front to have a little limitation run and the things and all this and that and they'd like to see our museum while we were there at the noon hour on the twenty second. And I told her we'd make some kind of arrangements for somebody to be there to let them in those little youngsters in for her to show those little youngsters this the museum, and that's, that's the 22nd of this month. Is that on Wednesday? I think so. Yeah. Sure is. Yeah. So uh, we'll talk to one son to be there to explain to him what's in it. And we'll have our next meeting then on the 21st uh, at the depot. That's Tuesday next week, the board meeting. And then our next meeting then will be on May the 10th, second Monday, and Mr. Ball will uh, They'll have the newspaper and you'll all find out then who the paper's going to be if we can't tell you this night of day. Sunday, is not? How's that? May 10th is on Sunday, is it not? It's another day. Say, yes, better, better, you better change that. Yeah. But it is left. I just heard it. It's the birthday. It's May the 11th, the second Monday of next month, and it ain't going to be in the paper. Now, <laughs> How's that? Well, I think the old start at 7.30, but then start at 7.30, and Hamley would that be the most of the best time at 7.30. Mm. Now, all of you that Miss Reddy, write your names tonight on the committees, and especially those that are chairman, should contact the rest of the members on their committee and then have a meeting and get lined out because we're each 
going to take responsibilities. We rest so much on the curators and different individuals up to now, and uh, it'll be much easier on them, and we'll be more successful if everybody, if all of us, take some responsibility in this museum and get to work, and it'll be sure be more effective, I think, if we all will feel a little bit closer and a better part of it. So again, all of you that aren't on any committee, if you just let the folks know why uh, it won't take but about a moment to get you there. Just like with the Cunninghams, how each they volunteered tonight, or somebody volunteered in the <laughs> And so if you don't volunteer yourself, why well, somebody might do it for you, so it might be easier if you uh, and you get the committee and all that you like. Is there anything else in old business or new business or anything you we need to bring up this evening? If not, Gene, we certainly thank you again for everything you have done and are going to do for our museum. It was mighty nice. It was nice to have your wife and mother with you.